Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Chang. I'm the head of marketing at Goldcast, and I am super excited to discuss what is the next frontier for video marketing today. Uh, we will be hosting a live Q&A at the end of the session, so don't forget to submit all of your questions and upvote the ones that you want us to answer most. Uh, we won't be able to go through all of the questions, so definitely click on that upvoting for questions that you want, uh, that you're curious about as well. So now to introduce our speaker, Emrita Mather, who is currently the VP of Marketing at ClickUp. She has led marketing initiatives across brands like Superside, Top Hat, Vision Critical, and Price Metrics. Um, she's celebrated for growing Superside from zero to 45 million AR in under four years and is known for her work in product marketing, marketing strategy, lead generation, and go-to-market strategy. Super passionate about B2B product marketing, Amrita advises young companies on leveraging marketing for growth and success, emphasizing the transformative power of great execution. Welcome, Amrita. Join, please join me on stage. Hey, happy Hi, to be here. This is going to be How good. Are you? I am good. Hopped up, you know, got my coffee, double espresso, ready to go. Good, good. Where are you based? I'm in, let me just, how, how do I say this? The land of the Drake. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, we used to be oh. known for like lame stuff, like the, you know, the space arm and like the CN Tower, but now we, we're known for Drake. Like everyone's like, oh my God, Toronto's the shit. I was like, have you been there? No, 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 we haven't. <laughs> but, you know, everybody knows that Drake is from here. So the six, as we call it. That's awesome. Um, if there's anybody else also in the Toronto area, please let us know in the chat. Um, but Amrita, I'm super excited to hear um, more about what you've been up to um, since you've been at Superside and now at ClickUp. Um, my first question to you is, let's talk a little bit about video and uh, multimodal content strategy. And before I, we go into it, multimodal, what I mean by that is a combination of text and video, blending text and video. We, we're looking at statistics and we know that um, marketers, perf like not marketers, human beings prefer to consume messaging and content that is mixed in terms of the, the multimodal content. Um, just pure text isn't as appealing as text plus video and text plus video plus images. Um, so I'd love to sort of talk to you a little bit about video, multimodal content and how it is, um, you know, why is, is it a big part of your marketing strategy at ClickUp? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I actually never knew the term multimodal um, I, I don't think I even thought of it as consciously as you've just described. It's it's always just been, you know, just thinking about how people consume stuff. And I, I think about how I consume stuff. Like, I, I think a lot of us have gotten used to, um, you know, sort of like the bite-sized videos on YouTube, like the YouTube shorts. You know, I, I watch a fair bit of, sorry to admit, but like a fair bit of like TikTok and Instagram reels. And certainly like my engagement with video is perhaps a bit deeper, a bit better. Um, and so it, it was just obvious to me like four or five years ago that that's sort of the way to go. And I, and I, and I actually don't think that how people used to talk about it earlier, it, it's, it's not quite go all in on video and video only. I, I think there was like a huge, there was like a lot of hype five years ago around that. And I don't think it's just that. I think it's like, there is something to be said about the right proportions. Like I always think of content as a bit of a bento box, you know, like if you're not familiar with it, it's, you know, when sometimes when you eat Japanese food, you'll get like the perfect like teppanyaki, whatever bento box. And it's got all of these like vegetables and like the tempura and your protein and your rice and all of that's in like the right proportions. And there's something just so good about a bento box. And so marketing and content is just the same way for me. So it's like a little bit of written content, rich graphics, lots of video to explain complex things. That's just sort of how I naturally thought about it. And we experimented a lot with that at my last company, which was a very small, unknown startup. Like we, I joined super, super early. I was marketer number one there. And like nobody knew us because like we had no customers and no money in the bank. Um, so we had to start from scratch in a crowded space. And I remember kind of vaguely thinking, you know, how are we going to stand out? What is the thing? Like, how are we going to cut through? And we went quite all in on video, but also like not just video standalone, but like this enriched content. Um, and so, yeah, multimodal is like a new term for me, but just like enriched or rich content is kind of what I'm thinking. 
Um, I'm going to dump like a link in the chat just so you guys can see one of the kinds of things that we had produced on my last company. This one did so well. Uh, obviously, subject matter matters, but not just because of the subject matter, but just because of the way I think it was laid out and the level of video content that, there was, that was available, which also allowed it to rank really well. I think re regardless of what Google says, um, there is something, there's the, part of the algorithm is like, how are people converting? How much time people are spending? Like the time on site or time on page really, really matters. And of course, video can help with that. So here's just an example of something that did really well for us at my last company. So I brought that playbook to, to click up uh, and we're doing a, a ton of that with Goldcast and other tools, of course. Um, on the screen, just so we can all see it. Uh, give me one second as I screen share. Okay. I, I hope that answered your question. It was like a long, no, long yeah, answer to a short question. Yeah, I just kind of want to show the audience um, just what we're talking about in terms of enriched content. So you, we clearly see there's like motion graphics, there's there's text, there's kind of like that dynamic, you know, clicking through the different chapters, there's video embedded throughout and there's audio embedded throughout. So uh, it's really just like a very enriched experience, like you said. Yeah, but and this, we, we found that people, the same visitor would come back to a page like this over and over, which was great. And we also assume just through some other signals that this actually did the rounds inside companies, which is exactly what we wanted. We want, wanted a lot of people to share this in like their Slack groups, their WhatsApp groups, et cetera. And you just, you know, we, we, we thought of it also as a living and breathing thing. We, we never thought that, oh, this was one and done and now we can move on to the next thing. So anytime we found something or produced something, if we did a webinar, whatever, and, we, and it was kind of in the same vein, we would take a cut of that and come back and um, update this thing. And I, I believe the team still does that because it's a little different yeah. than how I left it. So just continue building on it until and, and as your team continues to produce content. So let's talk about how um, you're doing this with AI. So how is AI playing a role in how ClickUp is scaling this type of strategy? Yeah, so uh, there's like sort of like a three pronged approach. Um, we have not acted on all of it, but the plan is something like this. Um, use AI to obviously, you know, produce or at least brainstorm some of the content. And that's a very common use case, I think, for most marketers. I, I, we don't need to get into the weeds on that. Most of us do that on a daily basis. Uh, the second part is just using AI to actually find, quickly find, I should say, the speed part is like a very important part. Quickly find like the best pieces of content to cut away, like particularly through like long form video content. Um, you know, for example, when we do webinars or live streams with Goldcast, you know, some of those conversations are like 45 minutes long and like not everything can be translated in the same way. So we use AI to kind of find the best clips. Um, and the best part, I think, is enabling our own team to be self-sufficient. That is like a very key component to scaling it. We have an in-house creative team. We also have like a bunch of smaller agencies that we work with. Um, most marketers at, you know, mid-size to large companies have creative support. The challenge with that is that there's like a million things going on and you might be backlogged for however long. And there's always some other burning fire or priority that comes up. So you kind of end up in a position where suddenly your campaign, if you want to think about it like a campaign, starts getting slightly derailed or delayed because there's other dependencies. And so we thought, hey, what can we do to help ourselves be self-sufficient and do the job such that it's not just, it doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be like the best thing since sliced bread. Like that's the, that's the beauty of like social and email and everything else that the production, um, the, 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 the sort of like status symbol associated with production value is like not there anymore. And so speed is like almost the most important thing and the, and the meat of it. And so we just decided like, hey, let's just do all of this on our own team. So our content managers, like people that actually are responsible for that piece of content and own the distribution strategy on it, they themselves will go in, they'll find the best clips. And with Goldcast, with your content lab product, 
that's become quite easy. They'll, they'll do the cut downs themselves. We have no dependencies on the creative team and we're able to go to market like pretty quickly. So right after the live stream or webinar ends, you know, we're able to like send out the recording. We have all of the five or six different cuts and then we're able to post them on social and keep that distribution flywheel alive. Um, so that's been, that's been a huge, um, it, like that's like a hugely important part of our workflow and AI has helped a lot with that, obviously to make that dead simple. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that you guys found sort of the key jobs that needed to be done. And for you guys, it really was that time, but really, really being able to find those clips very quickly, going, parsing through the content quickly. That was what AI's job was. And then it kind of making sure that your team was fully enabled, making sure that that agile Agile identity is very much embedded in, in your team where everyone can kind of self-serve and not really depend on everybody else to be able to e execute quickly. Um, and it sounds like those two things combined is, is how you're being able to execute on this type of strategy. Um, is that right? That's exactly right. And I think the gone are the days where people have to have like technical skills or video editing skills or any of that. Like now with all of the AI tools around us, like so much of that can be done in a pretty self-sufficient way. Like just like a few months ago, a friend of mine used, you know, four different tools. I think he used um, Mid Journey, um, a little bit of Ch ChatGPT, uh, and HeyGen to create like a video of. Don't laugh at this, but Donald Trump saying "Happy Birthday" to me, like his mouth moving, but he's like in this like whole like astronaut costume. It's like a whole thing, and he just did that. Took him probably twenty minutes. And it's quite realistic, like it's crazy, his voice, like all of that stuff is quite realistic. And so, yeah, AI tooling has just made all of that stuff like super accessible and for non-technical folks, like it's, 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 a, it's a breeze. Yeah, very cool. Um, I'd love to hear at ClickUp um, how you got bought it, like the buy-in process, you know, like we're hearing a lot of, you know, C-suite, um, CFOs, um, CEOs asking CMOs to start using AI um, yeah. and CMOs then asking their team, go use AI. I'd love to sort of understand how that works in at ClickUp in your organization. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not a great question for us specifically because I mean, we didn't have to, we didn't have to do anything to get buy-in. It was just like assumed. Um, ClickUp's like, Click up, I, I don't know if anyone knows this organization, but we're, we're quite AI forward ourselves. Like we have our own AI product um, that does a whole bunch of stuff that I can get into like later, but yeah, it's just like, uh, speed is just like an assumption. It's like something we optimize for all the time. And in general, the vibe, like the internal culture at ClickUp is, you know, people that can get stuff done and get it done quickly is like where the respect like really lives. So there was really like no buy-in per se like needed and there was no mandate per se either to like use AI. It's just like assumed. And like, I think we're all just like that on the team. Yeah. And I'd say like our, our go-to-market teams across the board, not just like, you know, my specific team that I support, like all of us are like that. I mean, we have some insane use cases of AI, like our SEO team has built, um, a AI, like, you know, they've cobbled together some AI tooling that with one click, you're able to actually take like a blog post, like a 2000 word blog post and translate it to six languages and then actually get it up into our CMS and out the door after some human checking that it actually makes sense. And the blog post like is like, you know, it, it, it's all legible and makes sense with one click. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, and that's going to allow us to scale like our reach, obviously. Yeah. So I think, what you mentioned is very interesting how like at, at ClickUp, there wasn't a mandate. You guys were always, already very AI first. And I think a lot of people listening in can probably kind of take note on that. A lot of the tools we're using today probably already has AI built in. So we don't actually have to go out and find new AI tools to learn or train our teams on. It's probably already part of our tool set. We're probably already paying for it. And we kind of just have to learn how to use it and figure out what's, what's, what's the job that needs to be done and build it into our workflow. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, um, for sharing, you know, how you've been doing, been doing this at, um, at ClickUp. I want to talk a little bit about team enablement. That was sort of the, the big third piece of how you're able to execute this kind of strategy is making sure that your team is fully enabled and, and self-serve. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And can you 
tell me a little bit about, um, is it just kind of like the, the culture at ClickUp or is it something that it's trained on the teams to actually uh, be self-service in, in AI tools? Um, yeah, I think there's just, it's, it's not even specific just to the AI tools, just like tooling, you know, it's just like, I guess this ubiquitous thing where generally the culture is that we want people to be self-sufficient and not, and eliminate as many dependencies as possible. I think it stems from just like the way we tend to operate. Like for example, um, you know, we've ditched the traditional KPI or OKR system, and we've actually adopted more like a P0, P1 system, which is like, what are your priorities across the board for every team? Um, and when we actually do like the priority planning, we actually like have like, even like in Google Sheets or whatever, we'll have like, are there, is this a priority and how many dependencies does it have? And if it has a high number of dependencies, we actually talk about it like extremely openly. And in the planning phase, we actually talk about, well, how can we reduce the number of dependencies down to like maybe one other person or one other team? So that's like just like a way that we tend to operate. And so tooling and all of the stuff in between process, all of that stuff is just so, um, I guess like we just don't like to leave it up. Like there's the culture of like, don't leave it up to someone else, like own it entirely. Um, and the way I explain it to folks on my team and this is like, not everyone operates like this, right? We've all come from different companies and stuff. But the way we like to think about it on our team is like, if you're the person that's responsible for this, like this thing, own it fully, like own the entire like breadth of it and the depth of it. So again, just using this content marketing example, our content marketing managers, if they own, let's say a guide or an ebook or a virtual summit or a webinar series, like we do like a lot of LinkedIn live streams, you know, whoever owns that, they own all of it. Who are the speakers? Where are we going to get them? What is the topic? They develop the content. How is it being marketed? What's the distribution strategy? What are the cut downs? Like oh, the whole thing, the whole workflow is all one person. And historically, like even just like three, four years ago, normally that'd be like three or four different cooks in the kitchen, right? There'd be like some video editor person. There'd be like a strategist. And I, like, I'm personally just not a fan of that. And ClickUp just doesn't operate like that. Uh, in general. So on the enablement side of things, enablement such a great word, actually, because I, I don't think we actively enable anybody. It's just, uh, it's a, just a great forcing function. This ownership mentality is just a great forcing function to just like, figure it out. And the easier a tool is to learn, the easier the adoption for that particular company, obviously. Um, and again, just shout out to you guys, because I, I feel like uh, in our engagement, you know, we we definitely took like a good six months to like master a lot of the stuff that you guys came out with. But it was really easy. The learning curve was really short um, and we got there pretty fast without any like, you know, watching hours and hours of like YouTube tutorials or stuff. So it was just like super simple. Thank you. I appreciate that that feedback. But what I'm hearing, though, at the end of the day, is that the tool is not the silver bullet. It is really figuring your team out and how your team takes ownership on the programming. And the, the, the easier the tool is, the more helpful it is. But the tool is not the thing that s solves your problems. It's really figuring out your, your people first. Yeah, your people and your workflow first, for sure. And the tooling is like a huge part of it, because, of course, you want to you want to pick stuff that uh, people don't find onerous to use. You don't want it to be a drag on anybody and you don't want anyone um, so far outside their comfort zone that it becomes a chore. You know, we want, like marketing is like a fun job and we want to keep it fun. So uh, the tooling matters. It's not the first thing to think about, but it matters. Yeah. And so last question before we go into Q&A, I, I want to go back to multimodal content. And um, many of the marketers here see multimodal content. It looks and it looks basic, it looks norm, like a normal marketing asset. But but at the end of the day, what we're noticing um, at Goldcast is that a lot of these assets are taking a lot of effort to build, a lot of time, people, resources, money, and a lot of marketers are not able to fulfill these types of programs because of just the lack of resourcing. And so um, for marketers that are feeling the pain and not being able to do great marketing and not having access to these resources to be to create enriched experiences, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, so 
<clears throat> I always suggest like start small. Like I think I've fallen into this trap before where I've tried to like solve for something like almost too big. Um, you know, we like ClickUp is launching a bit of like a podcast series and, you know, we have all these grand plans and like the plan is just a plan, right? So where where we've pared it down so far is let's just record a bunch of great episodes and I've been personally editing them like just by myself and finding all of like the, the correct flows and how everything should fit together. And can I create my own clips and stuff outside of that? Like I've just like pared down like the MVP, the minimum viable product um, and, and want to come out with something that just makes sense. And I'm actually timing myself. I'm trying to also see how quickly I can like work with a single episode and a single speaker. And so my advice is like really, just, I'm just using that as an example. My advice is just like start small and start somewhere. You don't have to boil the ocean. You don't have to do this big thing. You'll get there. You'll get better. And part of the magic is like, as you go through the process, you'll discover something. You'll you'll get audience feedback. You'll discover something in your workflow where you're like, holy shit, like I didn't know I could do that. Um, you'll realize like, oh, you know what? Um, I, I actually, this is, I need to go back to the drawing board because this just like sounds or feels like everything else. There's going to be all these realizations. So yeah, just start somewhere and start small and make it like the smallest unit, like just in terms of like the, the, the Lego blocks, like just start with the smallest Lego block and just nail that. And then once you nail that, then everything else kind of can be like piled on top of that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Going into our very first question. Okay, from Stacy, what are your favorite AI tools, Amrita? Ooh, uh, again, I don't think of just AI tools, uh, just all tooling in general, other than, I guess, Goldcast. Uh, I actually use Riverside a lot, just again, for this podcast that we're editing. Descript, and I, I was a big fan of Descript, where you can just like edit a video just by chopping and moving around text. So you can like literally move the text or cut it up and it would like edit the video for you. Riverside basically does that. I don't know if it's through an integration with them or they've built their own, uh, but it allows me to do that really fast. We had a speaker who was like an extremely slow talker and I was able to speed him up uh, like 1.25 X and it just like all of it, like the pacing just like worked out. Again, it's just like a couple of button clicks. You like hear hear it back. You like listen to it. You're like, oh, does this sound human? Okay, it does. Great. I'm gonna stick with the speed, right? There's like just like a few clicks. So I, I love that as a tool. Um, ClickUp does like actually like we're very like musically forward as well. So we do we have like our own album on Spotify. It's called Workflows. <laughs> um, so if you find if you look go look at Workflows, there's like you know 12, 13 songs on there. But we're always adding to that library. And some of that stuff is created with AI. There's like a really great app called Suno. There's like a bunch of really, really great apps actually. Um, so we use a ton of that and just, you know, for, for like my own like leisure, uh, do that. I'm actually trying to create the intro music of our podcast using Suno as well, rather than like, again, outsource it, find some like musically talented people. Like so much of that can just be done by, by yourself. Um, and then, yeah, just me personally, like I, I just have been playing around a lot with, uh, with mid journey. There's, there's pros and cons. There's like tons of like these like graphic um, illustration and graphic artist kind of tools. Uh, but mid journey has been interesting, especially cause like they've gotten really, really good cause they've been around so long. Um, so that's just, that's just like a small smattering. Yeah. Um, I played around with Suno and it, it actually is very impressive. I played it for my husband, a song that I made for my, and I didn't oh, make nice. it for my husband, but he was like, this sounds like the chain smokers. And I was like, it absolutely does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and there's like tons of like, even like B2B companies are like innovating so much using all these tools. Like there's this one uh, tech company that's been around for a while that was like really well known for enabling uh sales outreach through the use of video so it's called vidyard and they're I, I always thought of them primarily as like a sales orchestration tool and video was just like an added component now they've released a product where you can actually like take um like you can record yourself 
And then you can actually record different messages with just your mouth moving. So let's say you're a sales rep, your mouth can just move in a different way and you can have a different sales script for every single person that you're doing video outreach to. Like it's actually pretty crazy. It's pretty realistic and yeah, a little creepy. Yeah, that sounds creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, question from Kishore, are there any savings on agency costs or in general cost savings through adopting these AI tools? I'm curious yeah. um, at, at, um, at ClickUp as you're doing these multimodal, um, you know, content enriched assets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't done the calculations. We don't, we don't try to use a lot of agencies for stuff like that. So the cost part of that would be hard to say, but you know, just if you translate time savings into money, like that's the easiest calculation I think. And yeah, we've cut down like all of this, like hopping that happens between teams. Like we've basically eliminated all of that because we just do everything on our own team and are like self-enabled. So I'd say like a, a, a solid, like a week almost on all of this stuff, like per webinar, per episode of any kind, I'd say like we're saving like a solid, like three, four days. Um, so just do the cost analysis of that, right. Of like, even if it's like one person's man hours, um, so there's been, there's been quite a bit of cost savings, but again, most importantly, it's like how quickly you can go to market and how differentiated you can be. Like that's the, that's the opportunity piece that you should also think about. Got it. All right. Um, so I think this is actually in reference to, um, the example that you shared. Um, so from oh, Nancy, I see. what tools did you put together, um, for all this, what tools did you use to put all this together? Yeah. So um, if I if I were to do this exact same thing again, the Superside example, which is the company I worked at before ClickUp, we used external AI tools. But now that we're I'm at ClickUp and we have our own AI product, we would do a ton of that inside ClickUp. So, um, you know, ClickUp has sort of like three Our AI product has like sort of three components. There's two that the marketing team like uses quite heavily. One of them is just like content creation, brainstorming and content creation. There's like a lot of out of the box pieces that ClickUp has enabled. So like you can say, hey, I want to write an email reply to blah, or I want to write like a blog post or long form content for blah. So like there, there's some like out of the box prompts that you can use. That part is like easy. You can actually do that with external tools like a GPT or Claude or whatever as well. Um, but like where we've actually like innovated a little bit is around sort of campaign planning and like project management. So for example, I could go say to ClickUp AI, hey, we are launching a campaign for our uh, product management, uh, product manager and developer ICP. And this is the piece of content that we're writing, which is gonna be the anchor piece. Build me a campaign around this. And it'll just go broop, and it'll just have like all the steps and all the timelines and even like people to assign it to because it's learned from my past campaigns. And it'll just like kind of like let you know, like the first draft of it's actually pretty good. And it'll just let you know, here are the rough timelines. This is how much time you should give between all of these steps, et cetera. Because of that build out of the project plan, so to speak, that actually like allows us to think about, oh, you know, like how, how, where do we actually dump our resources and how much time do I have for each of these like steps? And that actually just enables us again to like spend less time on the operational components and more time on the actual content creation or creation of whatever it is, uh, the, the, the go-to-market pieces. So in terms of like tooling, just to come back to the original question, it's like ClickUp AI, first and foremost, um, all of the tools that we use to create the content, of course, which could be Goldcast, Riverside, like some combination thereof. Um, and then typically, getting it up into the CMS, et cetera, is like a little bit manual, but at least the translation part of it has now also been automated. So that's typically like the workflow that we tend to use. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Um, and so thanks everyone for joining today's session as um, you know, we, we wrap up um, the session. Up next, we have Sixth Sense, which presents Scaling Account Follow-Up with AI. So I hope you enjoyed the session. We'll see you next. And thank you so much, Amrita, for joining us today. I really, really learned a lot about how you're um, scaling uh, and rich content with AI. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.